People live in fear that the planet will perish unless they drastically alter how they go about their daily lives. But how did the issue of preserving the environment dissolve into the present day global warming fear mongering? Now to understand how the movement became so distorted, experts say we can look at certain events in history. The modern environmental movement sprang up in the 1960s and very early 1970s. And it represented a, a huge, a wholesale break with the traditional conservation movement that existed in America for about 100 years. Two significant books were published in the 1960s that made the modern environmental movement what it is today. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was released. In the book, Carson condemns the overuse of pesticides. Aerial spraying of pesticides should be brought under strict control. Al Gore wrote that Silent Spring had a profound impact on his life. Indeed, Rachel Carson was one of the reasons why I became so conscious of the environment and so involved with environmental issues. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, uh, is often credited with paving the way for the uh, environmental movement. It was just a time when there was a challenge to authority stemming partly from the Vietnam War, the sense that the leadership of the country might be taking us in wrong directions. That would carried over then to environmental uh, issues as well. And this was read widely uh, by people across the uh, nation and particularly by students. Uh, this was during the period where the uh, student revolution was uh, breaking out in the United States. Instead of always holding up Chairman Mao's little red book as their Bible, uh, they just rediscovered uh, Rachel Carson's little green book. Contrary to its portrayals in the mainstream media, the IPCC conducts no scientific research. Rather, it was founded to promote international climate agreements. It was chartered to support a possible future climate treaty. So that's what they do. Once the authors are chosen, they survey the scientific literature and claim to reflect it in their reports. They cherry pick literature conclusions. They extend their window for what literature is acceptable for consideration if there's a paper that they think helps and they ignore papers that don't. Now the UN and the IPCC pushed hard for an international agreement that would require nations to reduce their carbon emissions and the Clinton administration jumped on board. Now is the time to cut back emissions, design 21st century solutions, and begin the steps necessary to return our planet to the stable climate balance that has been enjoyed by our ancestors. Now this set the tone for two infamous treaties that in the end were never signed, but they did expose the true agenda of global warming hysterics to punish the United States, redistribute wealth, and force developed nations to de-industrialize. Notice that no agreement requires anything. No agreement tabled so far. There are several proposals. None of them require anything by the countries where emissions are not only going up, but skyrocketing. It's not about emissions. It's about us. But the Clinton-Gore team faced a major problem. The U.S. Senate staunchly opposed any treaty that would harm the U.S. The Senate gave unanimous, not, not bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, support for a resolution instructing the Clinton-Gore administration, don't go to Kyoto in December and agree to this treaty or anything that looks like it, unless it covers, treats other countries like it does us and or uh, you guarantee it will not significantly harm the United States economy. With blatant disregard for the Senate, Gore agreed to a disastrous international treaty obligating the United States to reduce its emissions 5% below 1990 levels. Now, he also made it clear that he would go along with the environmental agenda at any cost. It was absolutely a spectacular capitulation, I an mean, utterly, utterly unthinking agreement to terms that were drafted by Europe solely to benefit Europe and solely to disadvantage us. Now, the unit run by renowned scientist Phil Jones collaborates with scientists worldwide, most notably Michael Mann, head of Penn State's Earth System Science Center. Michael Mann and Phil Jones are probably the two main figures in a very small clique of climate scientists. They're a group of scientists who work together to make sure that their view of paleoclimatology is seen as the correct or dominant view in the scientific literature. Now their view of climate science is best represented by Michael Mann's now famous hockey stick graph. The graph reconstructs temperatures over the past 1,000 years. 
Now it shows the earth warming at an alarming rate in the 20th century. It became an icon. It was central to virtually every uh, government's arguments that something had to be done about global warming now. It doesn't stop there. The hockey craft team was determined to prevent opposing viewpoints from gaining traction. The prime example. In 2005, they attempted to discredit the editor of the scientific journal Geophysical Research Letters after he published one of McIntyre and McKittrick's papers questioning the hockey graph. There's evidence that they were uh, trying to get the editor of the journal fired. The fact that they did actually uh, engage in a conspiracy to try to get him forced out is again indicative of an attitude towards the scientific process uh, which is deeply disturbing. So what are you to do after being made to feel so guilty about your, quote, carbon footprint? Spend more money, of course, on buying carbon offsets. Carbon offset is the idea that if your activity, say your uh, electric use and your driving use, it produces so much carbon dioxide, that you can offset that by buying something that will reduce an equivalent amount. For example, you can pay to participate in a project where they're planting a lot of trees. You are counteracting your, uh, your own carbon dioxide emissions.